preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. To figure out what the age of your children are, or children that you're likely to know, because as I understand it, I'm supposed to be talking about communicating with the younger generation. Is that right? Is that what you understand? Um, and there are really two problems, and they're not the same problem at all. Uh, but at present, they are the same problem for all parents of adolescents. That is, all adolescents are on the other side of the generation gap from their parents. There are no parents on the same side as the generation gap. There are nobody old enough to have an adolescent child. I mean, some of the young people who are now because the oldest people born since World War II are 26, and quite a few of them have babies, or two or three-year-old children, but that's all. So at present, there's an absolute, gener the generation gap between parents and adolescents, as well as all the complications that being parents of adolescents introduce anyhow. And, but I think it's a good idea to distinguish them. For one thing, parents at present are blaming themselves for all sorts of things that they're not individually responsible for at all. I mean, they individually did not invent um, the adult ban on marijuana while they were busy drinking and smoking. Um, they did not invent um, kids deciding to wear long hair in order to distinguish themselves from adults, which they fail to do because the adults are all wearing long hair now. Um, and individual parents didn't do any of this, although they may have responded to it in a variety of ways. But it doesn't make much, a great deal of difference how they respond. That is, they're not going to change their children belonging to a totally different world, no matter what they do. Although if uh, parents and, and children have got on very well and have understood each other very well. Um, sometimes it makes a generation gap harder because the children don't want to hurt their parents if they've got on well with them and like them. Parents have been getting on well with their children and been awfully pleased with themselves and thinking they were doing a magnificent job and bang, they come home on Thanksgiving and say, I'm dropping out of college and joining a commune or something, and then the parents wonder what they did. And of course, the answer is they didn't do anything. I think that's the first thing, that the parents did not produce the generation gap. The generation gap was produced by the tremendous changes that went on in the middle of the 1940s, so that everybody born since has had a different experience than everybody born before. And it isn't only parents and children, it's professors and students. And until very recently, it was teachers and pupils. Now we have some young teachers on the other side of the gap. And uh, that's upsetting communities just as badly as adolescents upset people in the home the other way around. And uh, there are now communities that are uh, passing rules that they'll never have a young teacher again. Of course, it isn't going to do them any good because Ten years from now, the 35, these kids are going to be 35, and they'll be the same people, and they'll still be on the other side of the gap, and they'll still be a nuisance. So passing laws about being old or being young don't help a bit. There are also the perennial problems between parents and children that have all sorts of different shapes in different societies, but it never has been very easy to bring up adolescents and it isn't likely to be any easier, particularly. Uh, the absence of grandparents, however, may make it much worse, because the grandparents used to give support to the kids. You know, people say they have a common enemy, and the grandparents are almost always more sympathetic to their grandchildren uh, when they're getting into trouble with their parents. If a daughter gets into a row with her mother, and her mother's mother is around. Her mother's mother remembers what a nuisance her mother was. And uh, this gets reactivated in the grandmother, which makes her quite sympathetic with the granddaughter. And so that if you have grandparents around, they take up a lot of the slack, but most people don't have grandparents around. And if they do, they've pushed them into some position of being so old fashioned and so impossible that they're not very much help today. 
because we've systematically rejected grandparents in this country, almost always. And then you also have the ordinary uh, problems of social change, that as styles change, uh, parents, if they try to bring up their children the way they were brought up, just get into a terrible lot of trouble, even without the major generation gap. I think one of the uh, most characteristic things, for instance, is how much it costs to take a girl out. And people are perennially surprised because it always costs more and more and more in each generation. And then you get a speech, you know, when I was a boy and took your mother out, or, um, and this is outrageous, $10 for an evening. Well, mom, you know, a movie costs four seventy-five. And, uh, and it's very hard for older people to adjust to changing prices. And they may adjust, they may know that butter is more expensive or something. And then the next minute they're having a fit about something quite different. And I was visiting some elderly friends of mine who were worth several million. And they, I asked for a typewriter while I was there. And they discovered to rent a typewriter for a week would cost $10. And I was only going to use it for two days. And they couldn't possibly spend that $10 when I was only going to use it for two days. So they spent a week f finding somebody who would get them a typewriter for $2, you know? <laughs> now, and we almost all do this. If you look carefully, that we, we don't adjust across the board to the difference in prices. We learn about one thing, and we learn gloves are more expensive, or telephone calls are more expensive or something, and remain unadjusted in the others, and are still saving money that would have made sense to save 40 years ago and doesn't make any sense to save now at all. Now, these are perennial things in a society that changes, and we've been having this kind of difficulty for several hundred years more or less, in European cultures. Uh, so that uh, you've got really three kinds of problems. You've got the conflict of adolescents and parents, where the adolescents, and this adolescence starts at about the third grade today, so I suppose this will include almost everyone, where the adolescent is, is seeking to break free and is afraid of breaking free, and you get this kind of, of conflict in every family in every part of the world, in one form or another. Then you get the not so universal, but nevertheless quite old point that things are changing all the time. And so parents can't bring up their children the way they were brought up. And then you get the generation gap on top of that. So that at present, you've got sort of, a, you're majorly stuck with a series of extreme problems. And, but if you keep them separate and keep very steady and remembering that life, it is going to cost more to go to the movies when you, than when you went as a girl. And that a lot of things that could be done then can't be done now and a lot of things that are done now couldn't be done then. That's something people can learn if they don't keep thinking that the drifts were all higher when they were young. You know. One of the characteristic things that you get in every society is the old man that says the snowdrifts were higher when he was young. Well, they were, he was smaller, so they were higher. And I've worked with one primitive people who have no methods of measuring anything. They're very untidy and they don't measure things. Or anything. And they're convinced that people are getting smaller each generation. So because people always remember how tall men used to be. You know, all those men that are dead now, they were very tall. <laughs> and they're terrified that people will vanish altogether because they're getting smaller every generation. And if you don't measure, that's the picture that you get. And you get it today with people say they're no giants anymore, you know. Uh, me, speaking of personalities, there are no great personalities, no leaders. They're all dead. And uh, great leaders sounded, felt very great when you were 16. And when you're 60, you look around at your uh, you know, peers, and you don't see anybody very great anyway. <coughs> so that sort of thing can be dealt with. <coughs> now the next problem 
of talking across the generation gap is a quite different one. Because it, it doesn't mean adjusting to the snow drifts or the price of movies. It means realizing that not by remembering anything that happened to you can you understand your own children. And people have always understood their own children pretty well by remembering what happened to them. <clears throat> when we were children, we used to divide the parents of our friends into the kind of people who must have been very bad when they were little and the kind of people that must have been good when they were little. My mother must have been a terribly good little girl because she was very unsuspecting, you know, and you'd get her to, a, to chaperone a picnic. And then after a while, she'd, mother would say, where are Julian and Dorothy? Oh, they just went for a walk, Mrs. Mead. Well, where, where are Elizabeth and Robert? Oh, they went for a walk too, Mrs. Mead. And, uh, but mother, you know, sort of went on asking where the next ones were, sort of. And whereas the, the mother of one of our best friends, I'm just looking for a cough drop. Sometimes I get new ones from the audience as a, you know, I've got it this time, um, as a way of being introduced to new cough drops. Um, whereas the mother of our best friends always knew what you were up to. And I, I was very unpopular. By, so I said once, you must have been a very bad little girl, Mrs. Gardy. And so the people that had been bad little girls and knew where you hid things and what you did with your love letters and so forth were very good at finding them when you hid them. And generation after generation, one could rely on one's own experience. And the people that were friendly to young people were the people who had a good time when they were young and continued, had a good time being bad, that is. Now, there are a lot of people who have a bad time being bad, and they were very unfriendly to the young. But, <laughs> But the people that had had a good time being bad were pretty friendly, and they'd once been young, and they hadn't forgotten it. They hadn't wanted to forget it. Um, but this isn't where we are now. And where we used to say to, you could talk to a parent 25 years ago, you know, and say, weren't you ever young? And sort of get them remembering. and. Um, you can still get some quite reasonable reminiscences out of people if you work with them. I was driving down Madison Avenue the other day and we came abreast of a man who you couldn't tell what sex he was from the back. But as we slowly passed him, a beard emerged. My taxi driver said, you ought to make them all wear beards so you can tell them apart. <laughs> uh, I said, hmm. Um, said, I have a cousin who's a cop, and he says, they even go into the women's restrooms with consequences too horrible to mention. <laughs> I said, I guess they go in there because they're afraid of being beaten up. Pause, and he said, well, maybe you're right. Come to think of it now, when I was in high school, first we beat up the um, zoot suitors, and then we wore zoot suits ourselves. And you, this, you know, gets a sort of, this is the way you used to work with people to get them to be a little open-minded and not in such a state. But that taxi driver, he, he made the association to zoot suitors, which is the old kind of social change. That is, that there have always been kids in high school that did something that the other kids didn't approve of, and then they beat them up or they didn't. Uh, but he, there was nobody wearing long hair and a beard when he went to high school. And all the men in this country had are reared to want to hit anybody who looks the least bit feminine, any man who looks feminine, more or less. And they've been exposed to terrible temptations to hit in the last few years. And they've had sort of double temptations, because first they got these boys who wore long, girlish hair and drove them crazy because they'd learned to be manly by wanting to hit everything that didn't look manly. And just as they were maybe getting a little bit used to that, the Afros came in with people with their hair standing on end, which is, is a sign of real masculine virility. 
So they, they'd just gotten half organized to the girlish long hair and all these afros came around in their faces. So they're having a rough time. And nothing that they can remember helps them a bit because if they behave in the way that they remember, they just make more trouble. And um, no one, no parent was brought up with space as part of everyday life. All the parents grew up and going to the moon was a surprise. And you get these kids that say, 14 mm. year olds, I used to be interested in space when I was young. <laughs> but uh, you know, we've been going to the moon ever since I can remember. Now I'm more interested in the inner city or something of this sort. And the adults are still trying to remember that we've been to the moon or remembering how many satellites are up in the sky or something of the sort. So that this, it's no longer possible to understand anything really in terms of one's own experience. No good introspecting, no good wondering how I felt when I was 14 or 16 or 18. Uh, the most that one can do is to try to remember very sharply where one was when one was 16 and let the children realize this too. Now, I never speak to a college group without telling them exactly how old I am in the first sentence and where I was when I was in college. That's where, where the world was when I was their age, when I was in college and what was happening and what we were doing and what we believed. And then I tell them, you can't understand a word I say if you don't know how old I am. So anytime you have a speaker, go and look up their age. And then sit down and figure out whether the speaker is as old as your father or your grandfather or your great-grandfather. And after you've done that, you may begin to be, get a little orientation yourself. I mean, what was going on when mother was 16? And what was going on when father was 16? Now, I've just read a very amusing new novel that's just come out called Old Glory and the Real-Time Freaks by Ralph Bloom. And it's a 17-year-old boy with a grandfather he's very fond of writing about it for his grandson and trying to give write a description of his grandfather that will make sense to his grandson in terms of what it's like to be 17 in the United States in 1972. And this is the sort of thing that one can use not to close the generation gap. You get people walking around, they're going to close it, they're going to narrow it. Uh, somebody accused me the other day of straddling it, which was a horrible image, because <laughs> I, think, I think of the generation gap of being approximately the Grand Canyon, and the picture of myself straddling it is not very good. Um, but, and you can... It's there, and it doesn't make any sense to say you narrow the Grand Canyon. You can have better communication across the Grand Canyon. You can have closed television across the Grand Canyon, but it's there. You don't narrow it. And it's only by knowing it's there that you can talk across it. Because you realize what you're talking across every time. But one of the things that we're finding everywhere in the world, that although all the behavior is different, and those kids look at their parents and their grandparents and they know they will never be anything like that. There's no use looking at them. They don't give them any career model. They don't give them any model of anything. They'll never be anything like them. And the uh, parents and grandparents look at the kids and if they're wise, they know those kids are never gonna be anything like them. They may unfortunately live in the same kind of house, but they won't feel about it the same way. If they drive a car, they won't feel about driving the car the same way. They're not going to feel the same way about anything. However, you are their parents and, their, and they have grandparents and these are real people. And they're really related to them. I mean, either by biology or the adopted child, they've been reared all their lives by these people. And the people are real. The differences between Beliefs and practices and feelings and ideals are very sharply different, but they're still the people. And you can cross these 
tremendous distances by tying things to real people and knowing something about real people. Now, I'm finding in New Guinea now, when I go back and visit a school, and there'll be now kids in school whose parents I knew 40 years ago, and grandparents that I knew 40 years ago, and uh, when they were just getting over being cannibals and headhunters, and I'll come into the school and the kids will come up and say, you knew my grandfather, Mongova was my grandfather, and you knew him, didn't you? And I say, yes, I knew him. Or another one will come up and say, uh, I'm an Arapesh, and uh, my grandfather was Baimal. And I say, well, then you must be a Musa's son, because Baimal had only one daughter. Yes, and you knew my mother? And I said, yes, when she was so high. And now these are people that are undergoing an incredible, what looks much sharper dis difference than we have here. Because uh, grandfather was a cannibal, and grandson's going to medical school. <laughs> and most people that are going to medical school here didn't have cannibals for grandfathers. It's unusual. But, and uh, they speak so many different languages that we know we're not gonna be able to save the languages. So the distances are much greater but you can tie across them with real people if people learn to take an interest in real people. But it's impossible to take an interest in a parent who keeps telling you they can't understand anything you're doing, they don't know why you think like this. They stand with a martini in one hand and a cigarette in the other, telling the kids that oh, if you ever smoke pot, what I'll do to you, or going into a tailspin, and a terrific panic, although once upon a time you people smoked when your mothers told you not to and drank when your parents told you, told you. But in those days, the people that smoked prematurely, whether they were little boys smoking corn husks behind the barn or little girls in New York City, uh, nevertheless knew they would be legal when they got a little older, that they were all they were doing was being prematurely adult. Whereas what we've been saying to kids now is, we've got our pleasant indulgences and you're never, never, never going to have yours. Which doesn't uh, commend us to them very much. The only parents that can really talk with any conviction on the subject of marijuana are people that do not drink and do not smoke and do not drink coffee or tea or eat candy, or do anything enjoyable of any kind, and, uh, and don't believe in it, then they're, they're perfectly consistent. They're not going to have anybody have any new pleasures, um, having given up all the old ones themselves. That isn't most parents, though, in urban areas. It's very few, unless they're reformed characters. And of course, they're impossible to have around as parents or anything else. So now. Um, how to make people human to each other, therefore, is a problem. Most older people will tell you the children don't want to listen. They don't want to listen to what it was like in the old days. Now, this is patently untrue. This is just a factual non-statement. The older people don't want to take the trouble to make this viable for children. They either want to forget it because they went, the changes have been so great that they can't stand remembering what it was like. Um, or they don't know how to talk to children. They give a lecture, and children don't want a lecture. One of the characteristic things about articulate parents is that they always tell you more than you want to know about every subject. Uh, this is truer of fathers than mothers. Fathers are impossible, especially if they're lawyers. <laughs> And children are oppressed by the fact that they're always being told more than they want to know at that moment. Uh, but by and large, children are fascinated. If you can really make the thing vivid enough, I mean, with photographs, you see, this is what your mother looked like when she was six. And they'll examine the photographs and examine the clothes, and examine the toy horse that's in the background and begin to incorporate it in their thinking about things. And um, if you can bring the books that you read as a child, tell them how what it was like when you read that book, 
I was given as a child, um, I read the books that my grandmother read as a child, and then my mother read as a child, and then the books that were being written for me. And this was explained to me, you see. And <coughs> you went back to these incredible, moralizing books for children, all full of hell, fire, and punishment, and, and sin. They were written for my grandmother's childhood. And then there was my mother's childhood was filled with Elsie Dinsmore on the one hand. And um, on the other, um, things like Rollo crossing the Atlantic that described the first passenger steamboat that crossed the Atlantic and what it was like to be on that boat. And at the same time, you, you, children begin to feel what it was like when you used horses and steamboats and all of these things. And then when the Oz books came along, the introduction to the Oz books says, now that fairy tales have no uh, significance of any kind, we can really enjoy them. And uh, the Wizard of Oz was made up to enjoy and not to give people more, any kind of moral principles or whatever. And children, you can give children a sense that life was real in the past. And the thing that makes it real is the connection with real people. Not a lecture that in 1906 the United States was like this. Or at the time that Theodore Roosevelt was president, the conservation movement began. That turns them off. It should turn anybody off. Uh, but um, if I can say to my child, the first uh, phonograph, recorded speech on a phonograph I ever heard was a speech of Teddy Roosevelt when he was running against Woodrow Wilson. I can still remember it began, the difference between Mr. Wilson and myself is fundamental. And you, you got something to take hold of, to go back to. Or one of the things that I'm... I'm find is c conveys a good deal to an adult audience is uh, if you discuss songs about the moon. And when I was a small child wearing white uh, pajamas with feet, and my brother was wearing white pajamas with feet, the same sort, when we were put to bed, white woolen pajamas with feet, and we sat at a little table and we ate cereal for supper and sang little songs. And one of the little songs was Lady Moon. Lady Moon, sailing so high, come down to little Margaret, down from the sky. Margaret, dear, Margaret, dear, far down below, I'll send my moonbeams, but I cannot go. <laughs> and that's the moon we grew up in now. My young aunts and uncles, meanwhile, were beginning to sing. Um, if you want a spoon, say, please, Mr. Moon, be a good sport and turn off your light. Um, <laughs> and you go back through the songs, and there are usually people around that can sing them, you know, and the things come alive for the children in terms of real people, real situations. And when you're dealing with adolescence, if you can remember the things that broke your heart, or for weeks, the date you didn't have, and the, the thing that didn't happen, and the thing that happened that it wasn't what you wanted to happen. If, it, if these are told without moralizing, see, one of the tendencies that have grown up, and it's much worse than they used to be, than it used to be, is moralizing. And what children especially love is the escapades their parents have been in. I love the story of how my mother, the day that the right candidate was elected for president, we're still trying to dig out which, who that was, um, led a revolt in her high school and led everybody out of the high school to have a victory parade. You know, that sort of ties in with present day confrontations, and things, although it was a hundred years ago. So that, um, but these are all tied together by living people. Now, when I went back to Manus in 1953, the people that had been in the Stone Age when I'd seen them last. And now they had a school and they wanted help with the school. And they, don't, they learned dates perfectly now. And they could tell you that this is Monday, October 26th, 1953. So I said, how do you know it's 1953? And they said, because last year was 1952. 
Um, and uh, the year before that was 1951. And we didn't know any of this until 1946, when they started their new state, new revolution. And I said, but how did you know it was 1946? Because the white man told us so. And no one had ever told them how you got 1946. They were bright and they knew the different uh, lengths of the months and they knew how to handle the calendar. They didn't have a clue as to what a calendar was. And neither do our children when they go to school mostly. The teacher puts on the board, this is Monday, September 2nd, 1972, write it. And the next day it's Tuesday, September 3rd. And I once talked to some kids at Junior R Richmond High School for a friend of mine who taught there. And uh, she said afterwards, well, your lecture was all right, of course, but uh, you mentioned AD and BC and they haven't got AD yet, which is high school. <laughs> So I made them calendars for the school where they were just starting to have a school at all. I made one on the evolution of the earth and how very late in time man had appeared. Then I made one that gave the historical dates they cared about. Now the historical dates that were important to them were the birth of Christ, the discovery of America, the discovery of Australia, the discovery of New Guinea, World War One, World War Two, and 1946. And you put that on the calendar against the same time scale that you put the evolution of the earth. And then I took the oldest man in the village and placed him in time and then took people at decades later so that they could see time in terms of living people. And it could begin to mean something to them. Well, this, but abstractly, they'd learned it all, but it didn't mean a thing. They learned it magnificently. I'd be at a birth and the clerk of the village would burst in at 2 a.m. in the morning just we were worrying about how the birth was going to go. He said, did you notice what time the baby was born? Was it 2.03 or 2.04 a.m.? And uh, what one of the things that we find today is that children are really hopelessly disoriented in the present day world. It's all descended on them at once. It's all descended through television. Uh, they hear about one minute about, uh, I don't know what they're making of this tribe in the Philippines that's suddenly being discovered. And just as they get used to that, they'll be uh, looped away to Northern Ireland is what's going on there. And uh, if you can tie all these disparate events together for them, then they can be much more at home in the world and the more at home, and they'll be at home in the same world you're in even though you're on opposite sides of the generation gap. Uh, and they'll gradually feel it more at home themselves. And of course, the other thing you do is you have to, we have to somehow make the older generation at home in this new world that is so strange. And if one's working at it together and beginning to make, you can make diagrams of where, what was happening when and begin tying things together. And what was happening on the other side of the war and where were you in World War II and you won't, and where were you in World War I? And where was grandfather? And then you don't end up with, I never could remember who came first, Plato or Hitler, which is the present position on the whole. I mean, they get it all at once and they haven't any idea what came before which. And so the world is, is flat and meaningless and strange to them. I think I, we, I'm not supposed to talk the whole time. We're supposed to have some discussion, aren't we? I never understand how these things are run, but. We would love you to talk a little more if we would. <laughs> well, I think it's more interesting to have a little discussion and then I'll talk to each question. Good. I'm single, I missed you downstairs. <laughs> yeah. Waiting. All right, questions. Well, this country is uh, more conscious, I think, because there's so many people in this country that have lived with small generation gaps. You see, there's so many people that are the grandchildren of immigrants. And uh, if they aren't the grandchildren of immigrants, most of their grandparents were the grandchildren of immigrants, so that we've had so many small gaps that we're probably more prepared to panic at them or more prepared to push the grandparents out of the picture. Uh, than, say, Europe is. 
But the generation gap is there too. Um, and it, just as much as it's in New Guinea. Now in China, Mao tried to turn it, he turned the children against the parents. You know, and that's the way he handled the Cultural Revolution. He went out and recruited all the kids and said, go after those parents that are settling down and aren't going on with the revolution. And there's several places where that happens. It happened in Pakistan to a degree, that they would recruit the generation against their parents. And that's a very, very harsh kind of generation gap, which hasn't really happened here to any extent. And then we've exploited it so, we've talked about it so much, we've put it on TV, we've associated so much with everything negative. And that makes it harder too. Yeah, because you're uncertain, you see. Well, precisely because you really don't know what will, you know, what will really work. You, we don't know precisely what will happen. But nevertheless, the only guides we have that are of any use are the past. I mean, we're not living in the future. We're living here now. There isn't any doubt in the world that children are going to live differently from their parents. If you just, people just got that into their heads, you know. So that, uh, because half the time they're trying to flexibly adjust for them to live in a four bathroom house somewhere. Uh, when we're not gonna have four bathroom houses 25 years from now, except maybe for visiting dignitaries. Yeah. No, I mean, may we I have mean, a question yeah, from the other mean. part of the room? No, look, may I make a point that. here? This is one of the things that drives me out of my mind. And that is that American audiences, most of whom aren't gonna talk themselves, uh, object to one person asking more than one question. Now, if you're really going to get something, and remember, it isn't somebody asking their question. It's something that's happening that matters. I get more out of talking to somebody two or three times, trying to find out what they want. And this rule that we have, just one question, please, because other people, other people have to have a chance, which is standard. You know, you're behaving in a standard chairman fashion and I'm gonna to object to it every time I go anywhere. I, because with an audience of a thousand people, you know, and only four people are gonna talk anyway. So from the point of view of the other thousand, it might as well be one instead of four, because they're not gonna talk anyhow. And you get more out of an interchange. You see, you get more if you're not sure. Uh, the other person doesn't talk if you've given an answer that makes sense. Now, if anybody wants any demonstration here about how to talk to kids, I'm going to give one. See? Now. Thank you very much. Uh, generally speaking, because we are here, we can to some degree assume that we are already working past the, you know, trying to get our children to adjust, because those people wouldn't have come to listen to you anyway. So, um, working, you know, one step further, in the sense of trying to, we see the world as being much more difficult than Yeah, but you see, if you believe it, if you believe that the world is complicated, uh, it's going to be complicated, and you don't know how, 
then what you have to bring the children up to is flexibility. If you don't know what they're going to eat, you have to bring them up so they can eat a lot of different things. If you don't know what they're going to sleep on, you don't bring them up to have their little pillow uh, because that little pillow isn't going to be there. And uh, you can raise children for the future if you're prepared to accept how open the future is. And if you're, you're not, you can't. There was somebody back there. Yes. You haven't mentioned anything about the uh, generation gap with regard to sex attitudes. I have a college age daughter and I'm absolutely in a state of panic. You know, Why do you, she won't, she isn't nearly as likely to get pregnant as she was in the 1950s. Well, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I can't change my attitudes and I feel myself in an utter state of panic since she's had the same boyfriend for almost seven years since junior high and I, uh, <laughs> And uh, maybe I'm not being realistic, but it's almost as though I'm saying to her, you know, don't say it to me. I don't want to hear, you know. And that is, if I'm being honest, that is the way I feel inside of me. Well, I hope you succeeded in conveying your, to your child that she ought to protect you. You know, many in well, many, many societies, right. parents want to be protected from their children's behavior. And if you can only teach that to them, they protect them. But you're in a much better position today as mothers of adolescents than the 1950s where they all got pregnant so their parents would let them get married. It's very virtuous. They all wanted to get married. But the shotgun was in the hands of the kids and they either got pregnant or threatened to get pregnant covertly or overtly. So the parents would give them a nice wedding and a, uh, support them because they weren't up to being supported. This is disappearing now and so parents aren't near, in nearly as a precarious state as they were in the 1950s. But as a parent, are you supposed to, uh, I, I don't know, uh, should I be receptive? Uh, well, if you, if you are a parent that can't stand what the children are doing mm -hmm. and aren't prepared to stop them, in any way, then you better convey to them, don't tell me, I don't want to hear about it. My grandmother said she did not want to hear about birth control. She was 80. She said she didn't think she'd need it. <laughs> and uh, although she had a very open mind about things, she didn't think she needed to hear the details. When is the end of adolescence? If adolescence begins in the third grade, where in God's name does it end? No. <laughs> They are coming to me with the same stories, with the same attitudes. I gave them everything. I am still helping to support each one. I have twin girls. Both, uh, one is still, one is getting a PhD in college. She needs a little help, and she's living with her boyfriend. And so she really doesn't need as much help as she did before because he's helping support her. And the other one is coming to me with all her uh, sex problems. She was telling, I have to be rid of it, and I'm remarried. But they still are going back to the same thing that they, uh, the same kind of discussion that we had when they were 15 and 16, when I was in utero, when they weren't uh, uh, at the breast. Well, uh, puberty is earlier. Actual physical maturation is earlier, which means people are less prepared for it. And being less prepared for it, the coincidence between changing their attitudes and getting away from home and making new friends, all the things we used to say went with puberty when puberty was 15, don't go so well with puberty when it's 10. And so that we're getting a lot of displacement and a, and a much longer adolescent. And there are a lot of people around here, to, around this country are going to talk like that for the next 40 years. Now, you, and there isn't no use over confusing it with adolescence. I mean, there are a lot of people who can make up their mind how they're going to live or what they're going to do. How, how, much, how much should you be supportive to, to this kind of thing? I mean, like, you know, you see your husband working very hard and, and you sort of feel, well, at this point, if you have a son, say, 23, which I have, and he's genuinely trying to find himself and you have a lot of communication and all that, but you wonder how much longer should my husband, who is in his 50s, now be carrying the ball economically and so on to this young man who is genuinely well, trying to find, you know, I mean, how... All right, how they can find they themselves do? without money, and they do it much better. If the middle class weren't subsidizing them the way they are, uh, you know, and if they simply said, well, you're grown up... Even through education? I mean, well, if, if, they, if they have a definite educational aim, 
uh, society ought to be subsidizing. Yeah. Now, yeah. as yeah. society yeah. isn't, parents that can will, but this subsidizing them for life is very bad for them because it gives them a completely unrealistic <laughs> view of life. One of the, uh, I work with Puerto Rican families in Latin America. I am a Puerto Rican. I work with Puerto Rican families. One of the, uh, uh, in this area of uh, the generation gap, one of the things that I have found is the impact of certain <laughs> uh, uh, beliefs that are culturally nature and very deeply ingrained that they play a part uh, uh, in the generation gap with the uh, Puerto Rican youngsters. For instance, one of them is the, uh, the uh, belief in virginity. Now that if a girl, you know, has uh, intercourse with a fellow and is not, I lose that piece of cartilage, let's put it that way, uh, then this is has a tremendous emotional uh, uh, impact in the uh, in the uh, family, and many of, of these youngsters get a, a little bit rebellious, you know, because they see all the other uh, you know, they feel good from other, uh, you know, from other uh, 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 ethnic groups, and let's say with the uh, common base of American new culture, you know, behaviors, which is different from the expected behaviors of the other uh, parents and the culture. And this brings tremendous... Uh, well, this has been bringing tremendous troubles ever since people came to this country in people who came from Catholic countries, you know, and came over here and normally would never have let their daughters go out unchaperoned and dating was a terrible danger and it took them a long time to come to it. Uh, it's necessary also to realize that Puerto Ricans believe in the virginity of girls and they believe in the masculinity of boys that are always trying to seduce them. And uh, so it makes a very complicated society because once you get out of the properly chaperoned and, and managed rural Puerto Rican life, and you're getting a lot of the same trouble in cities in Puerto Rico today that you're getting here. Bad girl. Yeah, but it's not nearly as clear in industrial areas. Yes. Is there a difference between older people and younger regarding the problem of the thumbing of America? The UN being high and by pedophiles. That it's all calculated to destroy the big The Dark State Show, whatever you name it. But nobody has to look at that show. The people that talk all the time about th TV destroying thinking processes carefully look at the shows that destroy thinking processes. I mean, t there are lots of things on TV that enormously promote thinking processes. One of the reasons... Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.